and the recording is now started. So welcome everybody to the Aperio for Wednesday, March the 2nd. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia and I will be facilitating this call for you guys today. Today our feature presentation is Saul Wakan and Grace Capwell from Texas State University who are going to talk a little bit about marketing Sakai. Saul is one of the individuals who has really been working on improving and increasing our marketing efforts in Sakai along with Neil Caden and so she's going to talk a little bit about that and then Grace Capwell who actually is a professor at Texas State's School of Journalism and Communications is going to talk a little bit about a course project that she did that actually studied uh, Sakai as a marketed entity and so I think she's got a lot of great insights that she can offer us there. Before we dive into our main presentation, we always want to take a few minutes for any project team reps or leads to give us any updates and announcements. So if any of you guys are on the call and have any updates that you'd like to share, uh, please feel free to do so now on the mic or in the chat. So we'll take just a minute for that. We see something here in the chat from Lisa that the Atlas deadline, so the renamed Twizia, the Atlas competition for teaching with Sakai is quickly approaching. The deadline is March the 15th. So if you have instructors in your institutions for whom you think that would be a great competition, remember that those applications are due by March the 15th. The winners get all expenses paid to open a perio, which is in New York City this year, where they get to talk a little bit about their courses and their projects. It's really a great program. I'm encouraging some instructors from UVA to apply this year, and I would encourage all of you guys to do the same if you haven't already. So thanks for that update, Louisa. Don't forget, Atlas applications are due on the 15th of this month, so 13 days from today. Any other updates, comments, anybody wants to share before we dive in here? I don't know. This is Tricia. Hey, everybody. Um, we are getting a lot of planning and uh, work underway for the QA of Sakai 11. And uh, there's always an open invitation to participate in that process. Um, it's coming along really well. I don't know if anybody on, else on the call is on the planning group and wants to um, add anything um, about that. Yeah, I don't, I don't see. I was looking for... Um, or Jeff Posh, but anyway, um, so just a reminder, and we are having a test fest on Thursday, and I will paste into the chat and onto the Etherpad the URL for um, the QA. Thanks, Tricia, for that update. For those of you who have not participated in Test Fest yet, it is really fun, a crazy, zany hour or two of frantic testing and comments going back and forth in chat and all kinds of stuff going on. But it's a great opportunity to be online testing with a lot of other Sakai users and developers all at once. So if you have questions that come up, and there will be questions because we're obviously still working on ironing out all the bugs in Sakai 11. You have resources that are available to you right there in real time, which I have found to be a great thing. So if you guys have not participated in one of those yet, you will have an opportunity to do that on Thursday. So thanks, Tricia, for that great reminder and for posting those links. Thanks. And now, without further ado, I think we will go ahead and turn things over to Salwa and Grace. Salwa has a brief set of PowerPoints that I believe she's going to share with us that are going to provide a summary of uh, some of the things that have happened thus far, just in the general timeline of Sakai and marketing. 
and then I think she and Grace are going to ask a few questions of us. They have a few questions for us, the Sakai community, and then they're going to have a few more things to say and also be available to take our questions. So I'm really looking forward to hear what they have to say and take it away, Salwa. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off with, uh, as Matt said, just a brief summary, and then uh, we'll move on to Grace. Uh, so uh, the Sakai Communications Project is an effort that began, really, at Marist College uh, with Josh Barron, who I think many of you uh, know. And uh, it began, uh, or rather the purpose, was to maintain Sakai membership and then to try to expand it and to build a brand and then communicate the Sakai brand. Um, so it began with a professor at Marist in his class, and they did a series of online um, information gathering sessions about Sakai. They talked to various Sakai community members and produced uh, a report that outlined Sakai's history and also gave us a suggested path forward in terms of communicating what Sakai uh, really is. And the next step was to work out an actual plan that the community could follow. Um, and so uh, that was the task that I uh, kind of handed off to Grace Capwell, who's a professor here at Texas State University. And um, that's what she and her uh, public relations class uh, worked on last semester, and that's the fall of 2015. So uh, Grace's students did a lot of research online. They had interviews with uh, Josh Barron, I believe Ian Dolphin. Uh, I know they interviewed Neil. Uh, they interviewed me. Um, they also surveyed the community. So they put out a survey and got a lot of responses. And then they produced a comprehensive report that's available to everyone. Um, this report highlighted the strengths and weaknesses of Sakai. Uh, a major weakness they found is that we have no real brand, uh, no consistent message. Uh, and that's a problem because it creates confusion about what Sakai is and about why any university or school or uh, other organization should pay any attention to it. So following the report, Neil, uh, Matt, Burgess, and some others continued the conversation uh, about moving forward with some kind of marketing plan. And we set up meetings with some of the commercial vendors and others in the community who were interested. And that resulted in the uh, Sakai Marketing Group, which is a very exciting development, I think, and something that I know Grace was hopeful about because she wanted to see that her students' work resulted in some action. So uh, that group has had several meetings. We have, I, I believe we have one on um, this coming Friday. Uh, the short-term plan at this point is to promote Sakai 11, uh, and then long-term is to come up with the Sakai brand, a consistent message, uh, and then to reimagine and rebuild the Sakai um, site, and then to consistently promote Sakai in social media and in other ways. So uh, joining me today and joining us is Grace Capwell, and she's the professor who worked with her class last semester to come up with the communications plan. Uh, she's kindly agreed to join us today to give her, uh, or rather give us, her thoughts <laughs> on what we can do and to answer any questions you might have about this. So uh, Grace, welcome back to the teaching and learning group. I'm not sure where she went. Grace, can, I don't know if you can hear me. You could. Grace doesn't appear to have her audio set up. Um, when I'm yeah, I know. I, her. Yeah, I just yeah. saw her on the on the cam on the webcam and. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. I saw that earlier too. Um, but her, there's no audio. Um, yeah, I see I, that. Right. Yeah. So, Grace, if you see the um, headset icon in the upper left over above the user um, panel, you can click that to um, set up your audio. Hopefully you can hear us. Oh, 
okay, so we have a message in the chat from Grace that her earbuds and her built-in mic are not currently working. So she will keep trying to get back with us so that she can get some audio. There is an option for calling in by phone, which Tricia has pointed out in the chat. And thank you, Tricia, for posting the numbers and the PIN numbers in the chat. Sure. That's how I call that's how I join by audio myself. So I, I use it a lot. So we'll take just a brief interlude here so the Grace can phone in so she'll be back with us. <laughs> As Terry points out in the chat, insert Jeopardy music here. And I see that another caller may have appeared in our user list. Here. Hi. So, hey, Grace. Good, mo good morning. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm having audio issues. Oh, that's quite all right. Take it away whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to meet up with you again. As you know, I joined um, the, your team before um, when my students were working on this project and it was a pleasure to meet you then and it's a pleasure to meet you today. I know we probably have a few new names on the phone call. Trisha, hello. Um, uh, I feel a little, yes, good morning. Good morning to you. You can hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, let me, um, let me just say that <clears throat> I want to Again, thank you all for the opportunity just to start off on that foot because uh, I shared this with Tricia and some of the folks, but one of my students said she knows for sure she got her job because of this particular project. And when she told me that, I said, well, tell me what you mean. And she said, as soon as I told them that our client was Sakai and they were this open source code system for learning management, that's all they asked her about. They had no other questions about anything else she had done or what she had done at her internship. And she said she just, she knew she had them at Sakai. So it's those kinds of stories that just keep me going. But I do owe you, um, I have a lot of gratitude towards you all for letting my students get to know your organization and learn about you. And then, of course, come back with some, some clear action, action items and some strategies to help you increase your uh, presence in the market. <clears throat> so having said that, let me just say that, and while I'm talking, I will try to get my webcam up. Hopefully that's not a problem. Um, it might be. Let's see here. There we go. Start sharing. Okay. So maybe some of you can see me in your lower left corner there. Uh, what, what we came up with, as you know, um, and probably some of you have had a chance to look at the plan before, is the most interesting thing of all is that you're greatest asset is your community. You are the leaders of this community on this phone call. And so it's very important for me to be able to address you because you are the most valuable asset. But at the same time, as Saul and I have discussed since the semester ended, at the same exact time, your greatest weakness is also your community. And let me explain that. Uh, when I say that, what I mean is that because you're so dispersed and you're really not centralized, and I know that's the whole theme and value of your organization, it does make increasing your communication capabilities much more difficult because you don't have a centralized um, office, with the exception, obviously, of the foundation, which 
uh, you do have a resource there, but not enough to really roll out a complete campaign like the one we've proposed. So I think one of your major issues is figuring out who could possibly lead some of these strategies and tactics that we've proposed and make sure they get done. Not necessarily one person being responsible for all of it, but perhaps dividing up the, the recommendations, <clears throat> excuse me, the recommendations that we made among different regions or, you know, I'm not familiar with exactly how you operate best. But I think if, if, uh, if that problem could be solved, you could really be off and running. Because without that central one person or team overseeing, making sure these things get done, uh, then it probably won't. Um, now, I know you're obviously very capable of doing that because you have your whole project list. You come out with new features. You, you fix things. Obviously, you're quite capable of that. Just apply that system to your communications. And then, of course, it has to be made a priority. Because if it's not a priority and it always falls to the bottom of the list, then it won't get done. And so uh, Saul and I were brainstorming about ways to make that happen. And, and there could possibly be an option to um, impose a marketing tax, if you will, or a marketing communications tax, uh, where each university pitches in whatever model you want to come up with with some kind of um, uh, funding to hire either an, an outside communications person to lead this effort, if you all don't want to take it on internally, or bring in someone to the Imperial Foundation office to work alongside the folks there, uh, Ian and Neil. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways you could do that, but obviously you have to have some, some funding to pay someone. In your situation, I don't highly recommend bringing in interns because the situation with communication interns is they're there to learn as much as they are to work. And when resources are this scarce, uh, you really need to bring someone in um, who can just hit the ground running and work independently and not need to be trained by Neil or Ian or someone else. Uh, so while interns are fabulous and it's a great option for them to learn, in your particular situation, it's not the most ideal um, way to go right now. Now, I say all that in the context of timing is um, almost everything. Uh, your version 11 is coming out, and I know sometimes the dates move out, but at, at some point, if you could put a stake in the ground just for the sake of communication, that would be really helpful with your planning. Um, as you know, my students uh, created a mock news release for version 11. So that could be pulled out of the plan, looked at, revised to get it ready to go, set a date, and then when it comes to actual delivery date of the product for all of your community, you could estimate a time and say, you know, it'll be ready for download on such and such a date. So you can always, you know, pre-announce it. Well, this is something very typical that we did when I was at Texas Instruments for 10 years. And so as long as you're um, honest and accurate about those dates, and those hopefully don't slip, um, if you communicate those dates clearly, then you've got nothing to worry about. But I don't think you want to waste all the effort that you've put into version 11 and let it just kind of trickle out in dribs and drabs. That is not the best strategic way to take advantage of what you've got here in this um, wonderful new new version. Uh, so I, I urge you to take advantage of that. And because of version 11, because of version 11, time is of the essence. Because I know the release of that is, is coming up soon. And uh, just like you do in your updates for your software, I mean, you need months in advance to plan for these communication launches. And so it's nice that you have some things from my students to kind of put into place prior to that if, if time is short. Now, I believe uh, Salwa mentioned that um, there was a conference, a big one in August. I think that was something we spoke about. Um, you can confirm that, Salwa, in the chat box. For some reason, I'm not really see here. Not really seeing any comments pop up in my chat box. But anyway, oh, she says May. Okay, so May is pretty quick. Um, there's time to scramble to get it together. It's just that, that if you did it in May around that conference, I think you're going to get more lift from it than you would if you waited in the summer. 
when it's officially ready. So for just a little food for thought, but there's a lot of thought that should go into the timing. If you don't feel comfortable with that and you want to wait till the fall, um, I'm not as familiar with your industry as, as I'd like to be, but it seems like typically the summertime is often not, not a big focus time because schools are not in session. So you might, you know, it might kind of fall flat during the summer. Um, although in my past life, uh, we did a lot of briefings ahead of time. We just use an embargo date and we just go to editors and, um, influencers, if you've got bloggers in the industry, well, I know you do because my students uncovered a few of them. And you go brief the bloggers in advance and say, you know, this is the embargo date for October 1 or September 1, whatever date you choose. And then they just have the time to write up their stories and, and figure it all out before they release the information. So there is a way you can wait till the fall. You just have to plan it out. Um, Sawa, is this the kind of information that you're looking for this morning? Am I on track here? Okay, great. Okay. All right, so back to my analysis about the community being your biggest asset, but also your biggest Achilles heel. You know, we talked about the human resource aspect of this, but if you, um, if you get past that, then I would say the version 11 is, is a big ta-da you could take advantage of. And then, of course, my students also made some recommendations regarding your website, which I do know someone on your team has been working on, because Salwa mentioned there have been some things that have been uh, updated for the web, which is awesome. Uh, but in a nutshell, since we're short of time, obviously, I think that the big picture issue with the web is that you're not taking advantage of your biggest asset, your community, by not featuring all of you on the web. In other words, think of your website as a way not to just disseminate information about your, um, <clears throat> your fixes, alerting about bugs, um, but, and I know part of it is set up this way, so I'm not saying it's, it's, it's an all or nothing deal. Part of this is already there. It just needs um, ramping up. For example, my students created a, a CV template. So if you took every single one of you on the TNL committee and you used your photos and put them in the template where it goes and then filled out that information that's part of that template, it's pretty high level. Um, yes, it does put the spotlight on you, but I think that you really need to do that because you all individually have so much to offer. And when you go to the website, you really don't see that. The website needs to become more human. It needs to become more, hey, this is our community. Meet us, get to know us. And then you'll find that the uh, potential universities that haven't signed on might feel more comfortable reaching out to one of you. You could divide them up by regions. You could assign uh, individuals to take turns being the, the new business or new development, I know you don't like to use the word business because you're not a business, but um, new development uh, representative, for example, uh, one of you could decide to take that on for three months and you divide it up quarter by quarter by quarter. And so as, as phone calls and emails come in, your designated rep for new development is on, on, on it. They're emailing back this university saying, yes, we're Sakai. Yes, we would love for you to join our community. What do you need to know? How can we help you? So you basically add more of a human touch to recruiting new people. And then by the same token, you add a human touch to staying in touch, in touch with each other and keeping those lines of communication open so that you don't have universities who are uh, beginning to uh, look around and see what other solutions there are. Uh, so that's, that's one one big ticket item I would like to see you improve on, I think it would really pay off. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just the TNL committee. I mean, you could focus on your people in other ways that you're, that you're divided up. You could uh, say, you know, this is the team for version 11 and put, put faces to that. And I, and I know I've heard many times before, it's all of us working on it. Okay, I do get that. But saying that it's all of us working on that, well then, then promote all of you then, because there has to be some identification 
with an external audience to, to who you are. Because when you're in the market, you're not advertising out there like Canvas is advertising its product. What you've got going for you is, is the control, of the, the creative control of your own product. And so promoting yourself is, is really the way to go. It's like, come join us. Come get a feel for what it's like over here. And then, oh, by the way, it's going to cost you a fraction of what these other options would cost you. Um, that's a whole other subject. And, you know, marketing yourself based on price is never something that's recommended. But in your case, it doesn't hurt you because you're not competing in a commercial setting at all. And so outlining the differences between being as transparent as you possibly can and as accurate as you possibly can, outlining the differences in what it would cost a university uh, to use Sakai versus a leading competitor like Canvas is only going to help your cause for sure. Because I know that's not the number one um, that's not the number one advantage of Sakai, but my goodness, it certainly needs to be more a part of your education to the potential recruited university because they're looking at cost, whether you like it or not. That is a big factor. And in fact, I just heard on the radio, I guess, day before yesterday, that UT, which is um, one of the top two state universities in Texas here in Austin, is increasing its fees to students by $500 per semester. And I couldn't help but think that maybe that has to do a little bit with the fact that they have an expensive learning management system. And I think what we discovered in class uh, was that they were going to Canvas, but I've also heard, since we're close neighbors here, they also use multiple learning management systems within their environment. And it kind of harkened back to the days when Saul was explaining to me the history of Texas State, where we're from, how there were a period of three years where we had two systems the faculty could access and learn. And, and oh my goodness, I can't imagine anyone who'd want to be in that situation if they had a choice. So, um, you know, the, the more you can educate those people who haven't used Sakai about that issue on cost is, is, is important. And I wholeheartedly agree with Salwa and the rest of your leadership team that you don't ever want to use the word free, because technically it's not free, right? It does have costs associated with it, but it's extremely cost effective. So as long as you use the right, the right wording, and using the word free is not, not a problem, um, but you don't want to mislead either. That's why I say just be cautious of that. And plus, we all know the psychological pricing factor of saying something is free, immediately in your mind you say, well, if it's free, it can't be that good, right? So, you know, I, I would shy away from that. But as far as, as turning up the nozzle on, turning up the volume on, on educating people about the cost is, is well worth the effort. And, you know, you can do that in a very human way. You can take a university who was in that situation, who's willing to tell their story, and it needs to be told very briefly. That's the whole key to communication right now. These cannot be long, drawn-out things. They have to be uh, chunks, chunks of information that are very easily digestible, right? Snacks, right? Snacking on this kind of communication about your success story. So when you log on to the, onto your website, you see Sakai success stories, and you click on that, and you see a couple of paragraphs about Texas State University and how they went from Blackboard to Sakai and, and you know, kind of what it's meant for them and maybe pictures of people who literally work on Sakai to humanize this. Um, I think that would go a long way in, you know, tell stories, tell stories. Don't just keep it technical. Um, let me read some of these comments here really quickly. Right, right. Steve says, Universities choosing new software want to know there is a supportive development community for a product. Absolutely, yes. Um, I've personally been shopping around for a um, easy to use, create my own website type software. And, and <clears throat> most of the commercial ones, it's called Squarespace, Weebly, Wix, you're probably familiar with these, but they really tout the 24 seven support. People want to know there's going to be someone there when they have a problem. So absolutely, Steve, I 100% agree. Uh, you know, Sakai support 
could be a, a link on your website. Sakai Success, another one. Just use the S alliteration for more interesting um, information. Um, Terry says there are a lot of good stories of individuals and institutions, and I totally believe that. But this is where uh, this is where the understanding of putting resources and priorities towards communications is so important, because it takes legwork and brain work to go out and gather those stories. And it costs money to do that. The communications function costs money. And it needs to be at a very high management priority level to allocate that kind of dedication to it, which is why I say don't go with interns. You need to go with a pro who can contact a university, one of your folks, and say, I need to hear this story. You know, I need to come out with my camera. I'd like to do a video, you know, and that person, that's their job. And you guys have full-time jobs already. So to find the bandwidth to do that is difficult. So I really think for success going forward, you, you need a communications specialist supporting this effort. Um, and just because you do that and you hire someone to tell your story doesn't mean all of a sudden you've sold your soul and your, um, you know, your, um, uh, um, you've lost uh, integrity, it, it, it's what you have to do now to survive in this market. And that's, that's how the good ones are, are doing it. They're doing it the best way, using all the digital technology, and all of that takes time, effort, and money. So I'm glad to hear that from Terry, that there's great stories, because my one semester with the students, we did not have the time or the bandwidth to go out and find a lot of those stories. So I would definitely follow up on that. Um, Absolutely, Steve, especially when the product is open source. Um, yes, when the product is open source, for sure. Um, now, this is a point where sort of this, this kind of goes beyond my realm of, of knowledge, but if, if I were a developer and I was interested in Sakai, I'd want to know there was a quick place to go on the web for all the really um, popular questions. And I believe there is a spot for that already now. So. I probably ought to be careful there because you might already have that. But, um, yeah, as, uh, you know, I mean, a live chat button, or at least a live chat button between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern time or something something like that where people know they can just 24-7, not 24-7, but just find someone quickly to answer a question. That That might be helpful. Um, okay, so Fawei says, in terms of effective communication, I assume that the key and very first step is to let our perspective insinuations know how Sakai is different from other. Hmm. Okay, so you'll have to inform me, Fawei, what is the VLEs? Because I do not know that acronym. Um, Grace, I think VLEs stand for Virtual Learning Environment. So the same thing as a learning oh. management system. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. So when you say the very first step is to let our perspective insinuation, what do you mean by perspective insinuation? I don't understand that. You there? I don't know if I lost you guys or what, but. Uh, oh, you're, you're here, Grace. I'm wondering that maybe Fawe might have meant institutions there instead of insinuation. So maybe he's talking about letting our respective schools know how Sakai is different. Oh, I'll bet that is what it is. Yeah, like a, a typo. Yes, our perspective institutions, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is the first step, definitely. Uh, and obviously, you're a global entity, so you've got people in different regions of the world that can really attest to the advantages of Sakai in their own market that might be different from another market. Um, and again, this takes more time and knowledge, but I don't know if Canvas is global, but the way they've aggressively marketed themselves, I would imagine they'll take any customer that wants to come along. Um, another step that, unfortunately, my students and I, we did, didn't have the time to go as in-depth on this as, as I'd wanted to, because as you can imagine, being undergraduate students, they didn't even know what open source meant when the semester started. So we had a huge learning curve. 
So as a result, there were things I would have liked to have done that I was not, you know, able to have the time to do. But one of them is really taking the time to identify the type of institutions that are the most promising recruits. So, for example, you know, paint a profile if you can. And this is just take someone doing the hard research work, looking at who your members are. Are they more public or are they more private? Are they less than 10,000 students or more than 10,000? Uh, you know, if, if you can prioritize that way, then you can devote your resources to really funneling your message to those people. And if you get more of the type of university that can really take advantage of Sakai, which I'm assuming is like my university, Texas State, um, I, I shouldn't assume, though, because obviously our neighbor to the north in Austin, UT, has 50,000 plus students, and they're not using Sakai. So maybe it isn't a large institution type product. You know, maybe whatever the sweet spot is, I would say one of your steps is identifying what that is. And it may have nothing to do with demographics. It may not be about uh, where they're located or how many students or uh, other type of demographic data. It might be more psychographic. Like, for example, the decision makers are vice presidents in the information technology department. And nine times out of 10, I'm making this up, by the way. This is a hypothetical. Nine times out of 10, it's that VP that has the final decision. We don't know that, but if that's the case, then that's your target audience. And who, who, is that, who is that vice president and how has he or she come to know about Sakai? Um, in the short amount of time we researched Sakai and talked to people, especially a lot of great info from Salwa, it boiled down to meeting, meeting someone at a conference. You know, and going out for a cup of coffee and saying, you know, and getting to know them. So if, if you can build success by literally going to a conference and meeting these IT VPs from universities and trying to persuade them to think about Sakai, then, then that's what you're going to need to do. So it all depends on who's really making that decision because you know, like a lot of things in technology, it's, it's uh, a, long, a long process and it takes a lot of convincing to get them to switch. And so, therefore, if, if that's too difficult of a mountain to climb, then going out and recruiting someone brand new who doesn't need to switch might be your better option. And I'm kind of talking all over the place now, so I want to get your questions answered. Let me go to the next one. Um, Okay, I'm looking at Steve. A lot of users may be unsettled by talk of new features in V11 that might be difficult or worse. Might ooh, okay. Wow. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I think you need to put some thought into. Uh, if I was within your organization and I heard you say that, I would start with difficult to learn, identifying. What aspects are difficult to learn? Keeping in mind that transparency, which this is preaching to the choir for your group, because you're very transparent. So you'd be surprised at how not transparent most of the companies are. But being as tra transparent as you can, obviously, about just within your own team, identifying those difficulties of where things are going to be difficult to learn, and then coming out aggressively with the education component to combat that from the get-go. And if that means you can't release in May or you can't release in June, then that's fine. You need to postpone the release so you've got those ducks in order because it's worse to announce and then have everybody be frustrated than it is to wait until you have all your um, materials ready for them to not be frustrated. Uh, and then you said, or worse, might break their existing site. That one is a kind of a scary one. If there's any reality to that, then I would definitely address that. Um, gosh, uh, yeah, that's a big one. If it would break their existing site. You know, there's a lot of ways you can go with that. I mean, if, if you tested it before you announced it with a couple of universities uh, privately, 
uh, over the summer. So if it breaks, it won't be this catastrophe for lots and lots of students. Um, you know, you might think about doing a, a, a little beta type release like that, a private one, so you can uncover whether or not that's actual, actually a reality. Because if it is, that's a scary one. Because if people start to hear about sites breaking down, that's, that's going to be a crisis that you could have avoided. So don't do that to yourself. You know, that's, that's just self-torture in my opinion. So make sure that does not, that, that potential for that happening is minimized as much as possible. And you might know in the back of your head exactly the part of the new version that you're, you're worried about. And if so, I would, I would address that um, prior to the, the bigger public release, if I were you. Uh, how should we manage the message to users, new features, or reassurance, or both? Okay. So that's a really good one. That's more in my bailiwick about messages. What, what I've been trained to do and what I think is appropriate here is that you tailor your message to your audience. So you've got an audience of existing community and users that um, you gear your messages toward them. Those might be slightly different than the broader release to the community that does not use Sakai yet. So I would tailor your messages according to the um, audience. And as part of your rollout, you know, you're going to want to have things like frequently asked questions, um, you know, perhaps video modules that show the developers how to do it, uh, perhaps um, recruit a version 11 dream team. If you have a dream team that's really poised and ready to support and assist these universities with any problems, that's going to go a long way in making sure you don't have a disaster uh, with developers who can't, can't seem to integrate it. And I know there's always technical problems with integration, so that just goes with the territory, but you certainly don't want a problem where systems crash, right? That would not be good. So I hope that answers your question, Steve. Um, Terry says, internal marketing can be key, it seems to me, keeping our mates on board. Absolutely, absolutely, Terry. Wholeheartedly agree. Um, your program started out, in my mind, as an external communication challenge for my students, as a campaign to communicate about your product that, with the intent to recruit new universities. But the more and more we got involved in what the issue was, and a lot of times the big challenge is just identifying what the real problem is. In my mind, it morphed into an internal communications program rather than external. Because in, in my view, knowing what I know now, that is your primary priority right now, is your internal, taking care of your own right now. And then the, the, the second phase, if you will, uh, not that it's um, not important, it's just less important right now. And the second, the second phase would be, you know, your external community of recruiting the university. You need to be sure all of your members are, are thriving with your technology now before you focus too much on, on recruiting new people. So um, I hope that doesn't sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. But anyway, um, agree with you there, Terry. And Jennifer says, I just got an email from Canvas just now. So, yeah, they, they, they're being very, very aggressive. And so let's just address the elephant in the room. Uh, they're more aggressive than anyone you've ever seen. And um, my students, I'm, I'm going to have to look at my notes really quickly, because my students, I was very proud of them because they uncovered the fact that your key competitors, have new marketing initiatives underway, uh, Canvas being the, the, the user-friendly initiative. They're all about that, um, kind of trying to mimic sort of an Apple-like. an Apple -like, um, They're trying to paint a picture that they're very easy to use and, and clean and simple. And they've got things in their product that can back that up. And that's why version 11 is so important, because I understand version 11 has got some of these features as well that can go head to head with Canvas. And whatever those are, those need to be in the forefront of your um, messaging, because that's, that's how you're going to have to fight this battle with, 
with Canvas. And um, the other initiative from Blackboard, I'm trying to remember now back since this was a couple of months ago, for Blackboard, oh, what was the initiative there? A big marketing strategy for Blackboard. Um, just, just basically trying to identify what their key theme would be over the next six to 12 months and really focusing all their resources on that theme and because we all Grace, I think we might have lost your audio if you can hear me. I am still not hearing any audio. I don't know about anybody else. Okay, it looks like Trisha's not hearing any audio either. Grace, if you don't mind, you might want to try just disconnecting and dialing in again. We might have time for just one more question, if that's okay. Can you hear us, Grace? Just nod your head because we can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe not. Can you hear me now? Yay! There we go. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's all right. We've got time, I think, for maybe just one more question, Grace. And I noticed that Fawe posted something in the chat about whether you thought there was anything else that might prevent Sakai from competing with another learning management system, uh, for example, Canvas. If you think there's anything else that might be a big weakness or something standing in our way on that front. Hmm. Um, that's a very good question. Um, uh, it's really hard for me to say, and I'll tell you why. I'll be completely transparent with you. I never got a chance to see a Canvas demo uh, in its entirety. I know Salwa did, and she said it was very... Um, good education for her. Uh, so to answer that question, I would definitely, I would come from the end user perspective only, because I'm not developers like you, but I would be able to answer that a lot better if I could see how Candace works and uh, compare it to, to Sakai, which I'm completely familiar with since I use it every day. I log on to tracks all the time. I'm on tracks a lot. So I know our system really well, but I would have to actually use Canvas to be able to um, give that answer a really good, um, give you a really good answer on that one. Um, you know, my students also said as end users, sometimes Sakai or our track system is clunky. And I think that's what Canvas has managed to design in and I don't, I don't know how, but I do know that their environment and your environment, environment are completely different. You know, you have, have had code that's been developed over time by different people and piecing it together. It's, it's a different model than Canvas. But the reality is the end product and what people use and see, that's, that's the reality. So if you were to sit down and 
get a focus group of key people, uh, maybe some student end users, maybe some faculty end users. And these don't have to, this doesn't all have to happen in one specific place. Um, but get their feedback on it. That will be your answer to that question. Uh, and I say get other people because they're going to have a more, you're going to have di different viewpoints. You're going to have the end user viewpoint. You guys are already so familiar with your product that it's almost like you need to test it too, but your situation is so different than the end user since we didn't develop the product. And so we can just tell you right away, oh, I love this because it's less clunky, you know. And then you'd have to say, well, what, how is it less clunky? And get the specifics. And then take that information, apply it to what you've got going for yourselves in version 11, and then promote those messages. So, um, yeah, and, and Steve says, clunky comes up in our focus groups with students. It normally means doesn't look exactly like the latest websites and blogs. You are competing, you know, in an environment where our technology changes by the minute, right? And commercial entities are, are incentivized to come out with cleaner interfaces. Um, I mean, that's the whole name of the game right now in this area I'm looking in to create my own website. I'm willing to pay someone eight, ten dollars a month uh, to help me figure out how to do all those things and have a template where I don't have to learn how to code my own website. Um, and so it's a bit highly, highly competitive area. But then again, by the same token, as a learning management or VLE system, you guys are definitely, you're selling your, selling, for lack of a better word, your product to a very specific set of people. And I think that's an advantage you can't overlook. You don't have a broad market where you're trying to find people in all different corners of the earth. You know exactly where the universities are. You can pinpoint them, you can find people's names, you can track them down, you can persuade them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I mean, that is one advantage that you do have. Um, that you're, you're that yes, there are a lot of universities, but if you compare your market to, to other broader ones, like retail or, um, you know, other consumer products, then, then your, if your ability to, to pinpoint the key people is, is pretty easy, relatively speaking. <laughs> so I hope that helps. I've really enjoyed my time here with you guys today. Um, Salwa, do you, do you need anything else from me? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, we've got, we've had a lot of good questions. Really appreciate your taking the time to do this. It's been really valuable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. So, um, I'm happy to, to, to rejoin the crew. Um, if you need me again, please give me a holler. Thank you so much, Grace. This was really, really interesting and really, really helpful for me. I know as I'm thinking more about how to continue pitching Sakai to our bosses here at UVA and people at other schools that we are working with and reaching out to. This has been so helpful. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. We've got just a couple of minutes left here in our hour, and there are just a couple of housekeeping things I want to bring up before we all sign off and to the next meeting for most of us. I know that we have talked about shifting our schedule slightly and we have shifted our schedule slightly for this year where we are now meeting on the first and third Wednesdays of every month, which in most months is every other week. But Wednesday is one of those months that has five Wednesdays. So my first question to everybody is, are we planning or do we want to have a meeting on Wednesday, March the 30th, or do we want to stick to our schedule of meeting the first and third Wednesday of each month? And in that case, we would not have a meeting between March the 16th and April the 6th. So do we have thoughts about that? We have one vote uh, or one statement from Tricia for the first and third. We have one comment from Louisa that she is fine to meet if we have a topic. Actually, Louisa's comment is a nice transition because that reminds me to ask her 
that we had talked at some point about the possibility of getting a leap update and I have a vague memory in the back of my mind that Louisa had offered up the possibility of doing that at some point in the near future. Louisa, does that sound good to you? Would April the 2nd, which would be the first Wednesday in April, be a good time for you? I'm sorry, April the 6th. And I'm glad to see in the chat that you know, Terry would like to flesh out some of these marketing questions, which is great. Um, I saw some comments like that from Fawei also, and I would love to do that. These are questions that we have been exploring a little bit in the Sakai marketing group. And I saw a comment from Dave that's really interesting that I'd like for us to unpack some more at a later time, whether our mission is or is not to compete with Canvas or simply to deliver the best LMS or whether those goals are working in tandem or relating to one another in some way. So these are all great questions that I hope we will get a chance to flesh out some more. Okay, Louisa mentions in the chat that at one point Neil asked her to discuss lessons on March the 30th. Uh, does that work for you, Louisa? Is that still something that you can do? Okay. Well, Tricia and I will be in touch with Neil to see what his schedule is and, and what his understanding is once he comes back from his trip. And then we can talk a little bit more about that. And maybe then in our next meeting, we can make a final decision about whether or not we would like to meet on the 30th or if we would like to push that meeting one more week to the 6th. And that's great, Louisa. Thank you for offering to do that and for being flexible and offering to do that either on the 30th or early in April. Well, thanks everybody. This has been a great meeting. Oh, Fawe has time for a quick question related to lessons. And if people have to jump off the call, obviously they have to jump off the call, but Fawe, if you want to do that, as far as I'm concerned, you are welcome. Thank you, Matt. I don't know, quick question, everyone. I want to ask, uh, we've been using lessons a lot and we were asked time, time again by the departments, um, they want to embed uh, content like HTML pages from the other sites into the current site. I just wonder if you guys have similar request from your faculties. Thanks. So we do see some responses coming up in the chat. Louisa says that she has seen this a few times. Dave has seen a few requests, but not too many. Um, Terry's commented that there are multiple ways to do this. Um, anybody have a best practice suggestion for Fileway? We haven't gotten a lot of these requests. Uh, we have an integration with WordPress that most of our faculty use if they want to do that kind of an integration. Um, Dave comments that Maybe you could throw them uh, to a link with a new tab or window, but that may be dependent upon the platform you're attempting to embed into the page there in lessons. This is a good question, Fawe. Maybe we can throw this out to uh, the larger group as a kind of JIRA of the week, uh, beginning of meeting discussion. Uh, Mariano suggests the web content tool for those cases, which is usually what we would suggest best in use uh, here at UVA. So those are all uh, good suggestions, I think, and maybe this is something that we want to revisit uh, in a Jira of the Week type discussion or via email. So thanks again, everybody, for a great meeting. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, and we will see you all in two weeks. Uh, two weeks from today on March the 16th, uh, when Leela Marshall from UVA is going to talk about the Panopto Lecture Capture Tool and integrating that tool into Sakai. So see you all in two weeks. It'll be a great meeting and I hope you guys have a great day. We'll see you soon. Oh, and one final note from Dave, that the accessibility group meets today at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So thanks for that reminder, Dave.